let's walk through single cell analysis. In this study, I've already added my two samples to the project. I'm going to go ahead and create a new analysis by clicking the new analysis button. I'm going to give the analysis a name, single cell analysis. Choose my analysis type as custom single cell transcriptomics. And because I have two samples here, I'm going to select all single samples and run analysis. Here, I see the analysis was successfully created. Here we can see the analysis status has moved from pending to in progress. We see now that the status has moved from in progress to complete. Let's go ahead and open this analysis. When we hover over the single cell counts node, we can see there are two samples here, 56,567 cells and 40,371 features, as well as the size of the data. We can click on the single cell counts node, go to the context sensitive toolbox here on the right, open our first task that we're gonna perform, which is the single cell QAQC task to determine the QAQC metrics for single cell analysis. To run this task, click single cell QAQC. We need to select the annotation file that matches the secondary analysis pipeline. In our case today, that's gonna be HG38. This is human data for the genome assembly. And for the annotation model, we're gonna use the GenCode genes release 44. We have the option of splitting by sample. For the purpose of this demonstration, we're going to not split by sample and click finish. The single cell QAQC task has completed. We can single click and open the task report here in the toolbox to open this output, or we can double click to open this output and view the results. We can use the select and filter tool here in the left menu to open the select and filter panel to view these outputs and make selections for filtering for our high quality cells. We're aiming to remove cells that may be of poor quality. These could be cells that were damaged during isolation or cells with too few reads. A high percentage of mitochondrial counts could indicate damage and may need to be excluded depending on the context because this is tissue and cell specific. We see when we make these selections that this is reflected in all of the plots in the data viewer, and we can go ahead and filter to include these selected points. Our visualization changes to include the selected points that's reflected here, and then we can apply this observation filter to the single cell counts node, select that node, and this task has been queued on the pipeline. We can go to our pipeline to see this task queued by clicking here on the name of the project. And we see this filter counts task is queued and when it completes, it will turn from transparent to opaque. Our cells have now been filtered. We see that reflected here in this result node. And now we are going to filter our features. We're gonna to go to the task menu different filtering options here. We're going to click filter features. So we're going to filter our genes here. We have different filter types that we can select. Today we're going to do a noise reduction filter and we're going to exclude the features or genes where the value is less than or equal to zero in all of the cells here and click finish. The filter features task has completed. When we hover over this node, we can see the number of cells from our filtered cells task, as well as the number of features from the filter features task. Both of these steps are optional. You don't have to do these filtering steps if you don't want to. And really there's no gold standard for what makes, for example, a gene informative or not. And really that ideal filtering criteria depends on your experimental design and research question. Next, we're going to account for variability between the cells, and we're going to do this with normalization. Navigate to the normalization and scaling section in the toolbox. Different normalization options are available to you to normalize your data. 
we're going to choose this normalization option and we are going to use the recommended button. This is going to give us the selected method for normalization. There are other normalization options that you can choose to do if you would like to. Again, we're normalizing these cells and click finish. The normalization task has completed. We see the output here. We're going to select the normalized counts node and now we are going to use dimension reduction to describe the structure of the high dimensional data by reducing its dimensionality to make it easier to understand. We're going to use PCA and cue the PCA task. We have the option here to split by sample. In this demonstration, I'm not going to split by sample. I'm going to keep both of my samples together and click finish. Our PCA task has completed here. Next, we will continue to reduce dimensions to visualize our data with a UMAP or a TSNE. I'm going to go ahead and cue the UMAP task. This is uniform manifold approximation and projection, another dimensional reduction technique. I'm going to use the uh, default settings here. You always have the option to change the advanced configuration options in any of the tasks here. I'm going to use those default settings and click finish. The UMAP task has completed here. If we wanted to view these results in the data viewer, we could double click on this node or select the task report. The same is true for the PCA node that we previously performed. Next, we are going to cluster our cells to identify similar groups of cells. We have two options here, either graph-based clustering with different graph-based clustering algorithms or k-means clustering. I'm going to queue the graph-based clustering task and I am going to keep the default parameters, including using the Leiden graph-based clustering algorithm. I am going to compute the biomarkers, and I'm going to keep the rest of the default settings the same. Again, we see the option if we wanted to split the sample here, we could, as well as, again, the advanced configuration options available for all of these tasks. And click Finish. Okay, so we see here that our graph-based clusters node has completed, as well as the biomarkers for each of those clusters. We're going to go ahead and queue the Publish Cell Attributes to Project Task from this node and select that attribute. That's the graph-based clusters. And we're going to give them the name that we want, graph-based clusters, and click Finish. This, again, is going to publish those cell-level attributes, so those graph-based clusters, to the project. When this completes, we'll be able to locate that in the Metadata tab, and we'll also have these attributes available for us to use on other uh, nodes. For example, when we go to make our differential analysis, next our comparison, we'll uh, use a normalized counts node and that will be available for us since we published it. So if we go to metadata tab, now that that task completed, we can go to cell attributes and we can see, okay, here are those graph-based clusters, those cell level attributes, and now we can use these in the analysis. Go back to the analysis tab by clicking here. An alternative way to view these graph-based clusters on the UMAP is to open the UMAP. I'm just going to double-click and open the UMAP. We are going to color by these graph-based clusters. We're going to go to Style. We're going to navigate to that graph-based clusters node. Now from the drop-down, this would be our graph-based clusters. These are the graph-based clusters from the cell-level attribute that we just published to the project. So we select that node, or select that, that data to color by. And now we are going to add our plot, the biomarkers table. So we're going to add a table, the biomarkers table, and now we also have those uh, the gene expression for each of those clusters, so those biomarkers for each of these clusters that we're visualizing on the UMAP. We can save this data viewer session and come back and make changes on this if we would like to. So that's an option that we have as well. Let's go back to the Analysis tab. Next, we are going to perform automatic classification. We are going to click on our Counts node, and we are going to navigate to Classification. Two options for automatic classification here. We can use Garnett Automatic Classifier, or we can use SC-Type Automatic Classifier. We are going to choose SC-Type. We are going to use the full database. Uh, we're going to use the graph-based clusters as the attribute for our uh, consensus cell type. And because we are working 
MPBMCs. We are going to filter this to the immune system. And we're going to keep the rest of the default settings the same and click Finish. Okay, the single cell type SC type classification is completed here. So we could open this and view the report for this classification. We can also publish these cell attributes to the project and make those available for us to use them downstream. So click this, click this, and give it a new name, automatic classification. And now we could use this for downstream tax tasks, for example, differential analysis, and click Finish. Just like previously when we published these cell attributes to the project, this will now be available when this completes in the metadata tab under Cellable Attributes. Okay, let's go ahead and make a comparison, differential analysis. We're going to select the Normalized Counts node, navigate to Differential Analysis under Statistics, a variety of different models that we can choose from here, including a hurdle model. I'm just going to keep the ANOVA model for the purpose of this description and click Next. Different factors that we can add for an analysis. We can add individual factors, for example, the sample name. We can add interaction factors, for example, the sample name and graph-based clusters as an interaction. Let's go ahead and include just the graph-based clusters here. Add factors and click Next. We're going to go ahead and make the comparison. I'm just going to make a simple comparison where we're comparing graph-based cluster 1 to graph-based cluster 2. Add comparison. We don't need to do any filtering because we've already filtered upstream in the pipeline and click Finish. Our comparison has completed. Let's double click to open that report. And now we can go ahead and filter the report. Usually you'd filter by significance, so the p-value that you find appropriate. I'm going to use uh, 0.05 here. I'm also going to filter my multiple test correction by that same level of significance. Okay, and as we filter that, we see the results here are less than what we started with. Oftentimes we can also filter by a full change. Let's say that's um, whatever we want to specify in our study. Okay, and once we are happy with our filtering criteria that we've chosen, we can generate a filtered node. This will queue a filtered node that contains these filtered genes, in our case, on the pipeline that we can continue working from and running tasks from. Before we leave this page, I just want to also show that you have your download button, you have your optional columns. You also have additional information for each of these features or genes, so you can open individual dot plots in the data viewer because this is an ANOVA. There's a source of variation plot, as well as an ex extra details for this feature. And then we can also uh, click here. This opens other important information about this particular comparison. For example, we have the volcano plot here, so we can see the volcano plot for that comparison, the upregulated, downregulated genes. We can ex export this visualization into a variety of different formats if we would like. We also see other dot plots, box and whiskers, so other information about some of these features in our comparison, as well as the results table from our comparison. And we can always save this data viewer session and come back and work on it or export this whole image for to our machine for further analysis. Okay, let's go back to the analysis pipeline. All right, here we see our filtered feature list. From this list, we want to perform biological interpretation, gene set enrichment. We can do keg pathway enrichment or gene ontology enrichment, uh, even specify our own gene set database if we would like. Purpose of the demonstration today, we're going to use the CAG pathway database. We're going to keep this uh, database default, but we can always add a new library if we want to. And we're going to click Finish. Our CAG pathway enrichment has completed, so we see that here. We can open this task report. And here we can filter these columns. We can reorder them by clicking on the column. We can filter, let's say we 
choose a particular enrichment score that we're interested in. Now that we've filtered these rows to less than 100, we can automatically view these plots in the data viewer. And we can make modifications to these plots, um, save these just like we usually would. Again, um, everything is connected in the data viewer here when we make these selections. Going back to our analysis pipeline, let's take a look at these particular pathways. Let's open the pathway enrichment report again, and let's select one of these pathways here. And we can see the keg pathway when we were right now we're coloring by full change. We can hover over this part of the pathway and bold. We see the genes from our filter feature list that are implicated in this part of the pathway. We can also see additional parts of the pathway that may be important and go ahead and save this image to our machine as well. Going back to the analysis pipeline. Okay, now let's visualize our filtered features. So select our filtered features node go to exploratory analysis and start the hierarchical clustering heat map task. In this task, you have the option of either a heat map or a bubble map. You see the settings are different. So in a bubble map, you're going to be grouping the cells by an attribute and then summarizing that group by a descriptive statistic for color, as well as that additional statistic for size if necessary. The rest of these settings, the ordering, the filtering, and the advanced options are going to be the same in the heat map. So switching back to the heat map here, I'm going to choose to perform hierarchical clustering or clustering on my features. So we see that visualization changes depicting that clustering that I'm going to do on the features. I'm going to choose to assign order to my cells. I'm going to use the graph-based clusters as the order. I could reorder these if I wanted to. I'm going to keep them in the same order here. I'm not going to do any filtering. And again, we have the advanced options if we wanted to use a different feature clustering parameter, such as the distance metrics or the point distance metrics. So all of those are options for us. I'm just going to leave those uh, default settings and click finish. Let's open the output from the hierarchical clustering heat map task. This opens the visualization in the data viewer. We can use the configuration settings here to modify this visualization. I'm going to go ahead and change the color. And I'm going to adjust the dendrogram columns at a scale and turn off my row and column labels. And in this way, you can make these types of visualizations and then export it to your machine in a variety of different formats. I'm going to go back to the analysis pipeline. This completes our tutorial on single cell analysis. Please see our videos on related information for other assay types and navigating the data viewer for visualizations.